Broadcasting Scotland and I'm Michelle Roger. We're in the constituency office today with Hamza Youssef, uh, Scotland's youngest MSP, who's also standing for selection for Glasgow Pollock. I'll come back to talking about Holyrood in a, in a while, Hamza, but first I'd like to understand a little bit more about what drove you into politics at such an early age. Oh, well, thank you for uh, interviewing me and thanks to Broadcasting Scotland as well. Uh, well, I'd love to say that... Uh, it was done by my own complete volition and uh, it was my own drive that got me into politics but the credit has to go uh, from my upbringing uh, and to my parents. Parents were both political mum, a Labour supporter as many immigrants were when they first came to this country. Uh, my father joined the SNP in the 1970s so both quite political but also at the root of it and at the heart of it both community activists and pushed me towards community activism. So I was involved in projects that are uh, you know, even before my, my tenth birthday, from uh, you know helping asylum seekers uh, with uh, helping the homeless with food packages, uh, mum helped us get us involved in soup kitchens in the local community, and a lot of youth groups and youth clubs that we used to uh, we used to do. So there's a dodgy VHS of me going around somewhere of doing a moonwalk and Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal uh, that might not, uh, hopefully, won't find the light of day. So doing all these kind of youth productions and youth shows and youth groups was something that I was quite involved in at a young age. But what actually got me involved, perhaps, into the, 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 the path that I'm down at the moment, and particularly uh, on the drive towards independence, was the Iraq war for many of my generation. As much as I you know, grew up as a young Muslim uh, in the West uh, after the attacks in 9 11, and it was a difficult period to, to grow up, a lot of questions that people wanted answered, and you were often seen as the conduit by which to answer those questions. And at the age of 16, that's a hell of a responsibility. But um, growing up after the Iraq war in particular, uh, I was uh, part of the leading part of the Stop the War Coalition and I uh, actually shared a stage topically with Jeremy Corbyn, his first speech I ever did outside of Scotland, mm -hmm. was sharing the stage with uh, Jeremy Corbyn opposed to the Iraq War. Um, and after doing that, uh, really having seen the opposition that the SNP were leading on in the Iraq War, I said, right, I need to uh, get myself more involved in this because why on earth should our sons and daughters be sent to a war that our nation entirely disagrees mm -hmm. with? Why the hell do I have to keep protesting in London? And we should have that decision made here uh, in Scotland. So uh, that got me involved, and uh, from there I just uh, got involved going up and down the country, delivering leaflets, knocking doors, climbing up tenements, pounding pavements, you name it. Uh, I did it and have been. Great way to see the country, incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, as well. And, uh, and the day of my, my very last uh, exam was also polling day 2007, and I got a call from Nicola Sturgeon, after the about two hours after the result, asking me if I'd come work for the first ever SNP government, and at the age of 22 I uh, better hand off to take the opportunity, and the rest, I suppose, as they say, uh, is history. So I've been very uh, lucky in some regards, uh, the doors that have been opened for me and the opportunities that others, mm -hmm. others have given, but at the heart of it, it's all been driven by wanting to make your community mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. So, youngest SNP MSP um, to be elected in 2011, and yeah. um, you're probably the only person who understands how Mary Black must have felt. <laughs> it must have been nerve wracking, exhilarating, terrifying. Yeah, you know, actually, I have to say the nerve wracking and the terrifying did come into it for me. I mean, obviously, I can't speak for, for Mary, but having spoken to Mary and being in touch with her uh, fairly regularly, I don't think she's nerved by it at all. She's terrified by it at all. I think she is. Uh, no, no, not really. I mean, at that, I think even at that age in particular, uh, you know, it doesn't concern you at all, it doesn't worry you at all, uh, you just want to do the best, uh, you know, you don't have any inhibitions. I, I think it's, uh, no, nerves doesn't come into it. You do always want to seek advice from those who are more experienced than you, uh, who perhaps have been involved in politics for longer than you have, and they're always willing to give that advice. I'm lucky to have had Nicola and Alec, John Swinney, Mike Russell, many others, giving mm -hmm. that advice over the years. Mary will have the same with the MPs downstairs. She'll have experience with Ailey Whitefield, with Angus Robertson, Angus Brendan McNeil, Mike Weir, etc. Et but at the same time, uh, she'll carve her own path. She'll find her own way. She'll find her own niche. Uh, and there'll be lots of pressure on her shoulders, of course. Everybody, you know, have been called a rising star for the best part of seven, eight years, which is uh, a kiss of death if ever uh, you needed one in politics. And she'll be called a rising star for the next, mm -hmm. you know, five, ten years uh, as well. But she won't be nerved by it the same way that myself and others haven't been uh, nerved by it and we'll just get on with doing the job that we're elected to do. The following year, 2012, you were appointed Scotland's first ever Minister for External Affairs and International Development, so obviously to set up a brand new department. Mm. Um, how do you go about doing that from scratch? <laughs> That's, you know, Departments have been around for years and years and years and suddenly you've got to, to create your own. That's a great question because uh, nobody gives you a handbook. I mean, <laughs> you've got to 
you get a call in the morning uh, that says, uh, can you come into the First Minister's residence? And actually, when I was first appointed, there was no talk of a reshuffle of any sort. There was one that was caught, caught people completely by surprise. There was no media leaks around it. There was no speculation around it. Uh, so when I was asked to go into the First Minister's office, actually, my first instinct uh, as a naughty boy, perhaps, was, what the hell have I done wrong? <laughs> and so I rack my brain. I actually start texting my wife and I'm saying, if I said anything, I've done anything that I probably shouldn't. And they said, oh, no, I probably just want a word about X, Y, Z. And I was taken up into the uh, into the cabinet room and told to just wait there. And just got mm, the the morning got more and more bizarre. That after trying to figure out what was going on, and uh, when I was invited by Alex Salmond um, to to be part of his government, uh, it was a huge honour. Mm. I mean, it's like it's like probably akin to imagine play, asking to to be to play for the national football team. Uh, not that I'll ever get that honour, but uh, in terms of the department, yes, nobody gives you a handbook, uh, nobody gives you guidance, you know, there's no guide there for you, and you just rely on speaking to, uh, I'm the junior minister, of course, the senior minister, Fiona Hislop, I work under, has been a fantastic source of guidance uh, in that regard, uh, and so there's been a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of help and support from that. But I suppose what we try to do with it, whatever department, whether it's health, education, transport, crime, whatever it is, what we try to do is ensure that we're always in touch with the needs of the Scottish people. And uh, from external affairs and international development point of view, there's so much that I can cover that we have to prioritise with the resource that we have, with the limited resource that we have, both human resource but also uh, in terms of monetary and financial resource that we have. Well, uh, you know, what, how do we how do we prioritise? Uh, and we do that from uh, you know what we think is incredibly important to the issue in Palestine, for example, that uh, we find that incredibly important and want us to be vocal on that. So we are uh, in the Middle East conflict. Uh, of course, with the migrants crisis as well, mm. it's currently ongoing. Uh, we think it's important for Scotland to have a voice uh, in that. The many refugee crises going on uh, across the world. Uh, and then the special relationship we have with Malawi and other countries that we do international development with. Uh, and then there's uh, our trade and investment, which is an important part mm. of the international work that I do as well, making sure that there's jobs that are being created uh, through that, so um, much of it is just about you know prioritising what's in Scotland's interests and what's in Scotland's, Scotland's needs, and ensuring that that is represented to the best of my ability. So three years on, what would you say have been the greatest successes, the, the things that you look back on and think mm. we did a good job there? Wow. Well, I'd say there's there's quite a number. Uh, I'm proud, very proud of the positions that we've taken in the external affairs side mm. of things. So I think one of the most important is to ensure that people realise that their government, the Scottish government, is standing up for them and for the issues that are important to them. So one of the proudest would be, for example, the Scottish government recognising the state of Palestine. I think that's a really important one to have done. You know, the UK government chose not when the, when the vote came up. Uh, when it's come up in Westminster, they've chosen not to recognise the state of Palestine. And you know, We think that if and we are true believers in the two-state solution, we believe that the only way you'll get peace in the Middle East it's through that two-state two state solution. Now, how on earth you can have a two-state solution when you only recognise one state? It doesn't make any sense to me. So this is not an issue of being pro-Palestinian, being pro-Israeli, being pro-this or pro-that. Uh, frankly, it's about doing what's, uh, you know, going down the lines of international law and also doing what you think is just. So I think I'm very proud of that. Very proud of the fact that we put so much pressure on the UK government to accept a portion of Syrian refugees that they finally caved in. And they took Syrian refugees, the Syrian refugee crisis. It's been going on for years and is the most dire conflict uh, that I think any of us have witnessed uh, in the last few decades. It is utterly dreadful uh, what is happening in the world, frankly, is timing a blind eye. I'm certainly not doing as much as they probably should be doing uh, with that. And the refugee crisis is in its millions, not in its tens of thousands, not in its hundreds of thousands. You're talking about four million people uh, as refugees, uh, let alone those who are internally displaced. Now, the UK hasn't taken enough, but the fact that it started to take some people was because of the pressure uh, that we uh, brought to bear. And we were the first government in these islands to say, let's take some civil refugees. We're very proud uh, of that. And then also very proud of the relationship that we've developed and fostered and, uh, with Malawi over the years. Uh, in fairness to Lord McConnell, uh, certainly uh, credit to him that he re-established that relationship with Malawi. But we've taken it to another level, whereby we're... Uh, you know, there's more people involved in that relationship than there ever has been. Uh, you get involved in other sectors like renewable energy for Malawi and so on and so forth. So I think those are some of the achievements that I'm, I'm proud of. But I have to say we don't go into government saying, look, these are the two, three things that, you know, this is my legacy that I want it to be. You want to ensure that even if you're, if you demit office or if you're not elected again or if you're not reappointed again, that there's enough there for somebody to carry on to ensure that Scotland 
that is moving down the right path. There are a number of issues that are really, really close to your heart and people mm. look to you for things like mental health stigma, poverty, mm. civil liberties, issues affecting young people. Mm. What is it about those issues that particularly resonate with you? Giving a voice to the voiceless, uh, in, in a nutshell. It's as simple as that. I was, you know, I was very lucky. My father, although an immigrant to this country and coming with practically nothing, uh, with my grandfather, you know, they worked really, really hard. Um, my dad, and, you know, I won't recount all the stories he's recounted to me, but you're talking about six and seven of six or seven of them, sorry, seven of them living in a one-bedroom flat in Darnley Street, in the south side of, of, of Glasgow, having to make ends meet. Dad didn't have a particularly, uh, uh, you know, had a, yeah, he had a particular difficult uh, upbringing. His mother died when he was 16 because mm -hmm. uh, of can due to cancer, and um, you know his dad uh, wasn't there for for all of his uh, growing up either. And so they had to very much carve their own way as well as being in, coming into a new country, not knowing a language, etc., mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et and he worked and has worked and continues to work his backside off. And also, all because he wanted his family and his children to have opportunity. Mm. But my dad always, always, always brought us up, and my mum too, to say it doesn't, you know, the opportunity you have, frankly, is just, uh, it's not just down to hard work, it's also down to a lot of luck. And therefore, your reason d'etre, your purpose in life should be to help others. Or whatever you do, my dad's an accountant, so he, he looks at his work as helping the community, as well as, of course, being a profitable business. But he looks at it from actually a social uh, prism. Uh, and therefore, it's the same for me. Uh, I'm lucky to have had a great life because of the way my dad, uh, how hard he's worked over the years, and my mum, how hard they worked. But I don't want to just grow up uh, by the end of my life and just having accumulated more. I mean, I see no value in that. I see no mm -hmm. purpose in that. Uh, the only value I can detect from my existence here on this earth is by ensuring that I'm helping people. And if you're going to help people, then you should help those that need the most help and the most vulnerable. Uh, and they are some of those that you mentioned, those in abject poverty or you know, have mental health issues or the vulnerable, uh, you know, and young people, uh, mm -hmm. and the most vulnerable young people, and we deal with issues of that are taboo in some communities, but we push them to the forefront. Uh, and you know, the reasons why I do that is because, as I say, if you're going to help anybody, it should be those that need the most mm -hmm. help and the most. So that's really what drives uh, what I do. And I think it's probably been, I'm told, the same for most politicians that are involved in the work we do. I think very few of them. I don't know for the wrong reason. Most of them, I hope, would be in it for the right reason. So the next nine months are all about Holyrood elections, mm. and it's different this year with so many new SNP members as potential mm. candidates. What do you think they bring to the campaign that perhaps wasn't there before? It's incredibly exciting what they bring. Uh, you know, we were a party of 25,000 uh, thereabouts on the 18th of September, and thereafter we've now become a movement of 110, 115,000. We've gone from a party to just a movement, actually. Mm which is an incredible position to be in. And I'm very pleased that that's the way it went, because it could have gone only one of two ways, right? Uh, on the morning of the 19th, either we would have plummeted or we would have risen and we rose, uh, which is the most important thing. Uh, and what the new members have brought, I think, is incredible. Uh, a new lease of life, a new energy, a new passion. Uh, and that's not to say that the old members of which I'm one, uh, it's just an incredible thing to say somebody who's been in a party for 10 years, but the veteran members uh, that were there before, uh, they made and have made and conti will continue to make an incredible contribution. It's on actually their shoulders that this party and this movement stands. Many of them who are no longer here. I used to work for Bashir Ahmed, uh, people like him, Professor Neil McCormack, many others uh, that have come and uh, have gone. So, you know, we stand most certainly on the work that they've done. But the new members bring such an energy, such a passion. Uh, and they're in all sectors of life. All sectors and different professions, uh, all sectors and diversities and genders, and everything else that you can think of, uh, which is incredibly incredible strength for us. So many of the candidates have already been selected. So some selections obviously are still going on. Many of the candidates that have been selected, particularly those I would say women that have come from all women shortlists, uh, of which I'm a great believer, uh, and I'm very excited to see them in Parliament. And I, I'm sure they will be in Parliament. They won't be complacent, and they'll work very, very hard. I would be delighted to be alongside the likes of some of them, Gene Freeman and many others that have uh, gone through and, and, and been selected. Uh, I think it's going to be great for the party and great for our movement. But what about the incumbents that have lost out on selection? Hmm. That's not something that you would have expected previously. Yeah, I mean it's difficult because you know these are colleagues, these are people you've built up relationships with. 
over the years, but I think you've got to just look at, you've got to understand, I think any of us that get involved in politics understand that every four or five years we're up to the, uh, uh, absolutely, uh, we have to, to, to pass the test of both our local members, but also the, the constituency uh, wider than that when it comes to the elections. And, you know, this can be difficult, it'll take, you know, maybe days, maybe weeks for some people, maybe even months for some people to get over that. But knowing my colleagues that haven't got in, I'm pretty sure they'll be back at the campaign trail anyway, and they'll never stop believing in independence, and so I'm sure they'll be uh, campaigning hard, and as hard as they always have been, uh, for independence. But it is the tough side of politics, Let's, mm -hmm. you know, can't really hide that, it's difficult to get that phone call to say, you know, sorry, you've, you've not been selected, it must be actually very difficult, mm -hmm. and you probably just want to go away and hide for a few days, but, uh, and, you know, we should give our colleagues the time to, to do that, but I've got no doubt at all that they've still got a contribution to make, and they will make it fully. So the polls are looking good at the moment. Mm. We all know that the only poll that matters is <laughs> is the final one on, on election it. day. What do you think the all the SNP candidates need to do between now and then to secure a bigger majority in Holyrood? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, they cannot be complacent. They will not be complacent. I'm certain on that. But you know, the moment any complacency sinks in is the moment that you begin to lose. Mm. Uh, you know, Labour Party were ahead of us in the polls uh, in twenty and they're up to the twenty eleven election. I remember the turning point, it came round about the beginning of the year, January, maybe the end of January, beginning of February, uh, when the, a Times poll came, finally putting us level pegging with Labour, and that was a great moment of change for us, because mm -hmm. then we, from that moment, we, 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 we led the race. But, you know, for eight, nine months, we were, I think at one poll, we were 14 points behind Labour, maybe even 16 points behind Labour in the run-up to the 2011 election. Um, but they got complacent, they sat on their hands and they thought we've got this in the bag, all we need to do is not make any slip ups and it'll be fine. And I think that would be dangerous, but knowing Nicola, uh, as long as I've known her, working alongside Nicola Sturgeon uh, and indeed other senior people in the party, uh, they won't allow that to happen for a minute. Uh, and I think every SNP candidate and every SNP member and every SNP supporter uh, has to uh, realise, and I'm sure they do, that we only get what we get through craft. And I love social media, I love emails, I get involved in all of that. But there is genuinely no substitute for looking into the whites of somebody's eyes and saying, look, what is it that concerns you? How can I convince you? What is it we can do to help you? Uh, and being on that doorstep or climbing up that tenement to make that case. So uh, ensuring complacency doesn't stick in and making sure that we stay true to our purpose uh, as well, which is representing the people of Scotland. And of course, believing uh, in independence as being the best future for this country. There's a lot of chat around tactical voting for mm. list MSPs at the moment. Is there a place for tactical voting or should people simply vote for the person they believe will do the very best job? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, believing in the party, and if, particularly if you're a member and a supporter, I would say, you know, understanding the core values of the party and remembering that the SNP is the party of independence for the last 80 years. In fact, independence referendum wouldn't have been on the agenda, let alone actually having one if it wasn't for the SNP and if your belief is uh, that this country would be better governed uh, by the people who live here, i.e. being an independent country, then the SNP should get your first and your second vote. Uh, if you believe that the SNP have been doing a good job over the last uh, eight years uh, plus, then uh, actually you should be voting for the SNP team too, based on their team, based on their record, based on the vision that they've got for this country. Uh, I would say there's a lot of myth about the, you know, the first and second vote uh, and many people have done some good blogs on it saying actually uh, the SN, you know, to ensure that there's an SNP majority and a strong majority and a stronger majority uh, in the 2016 elections you have to vote SNP 1 and SNP 2 uh, and I'll be making sure that those blogs and those numbers get disseminated <laughs> very wide across social media I think anybody thinking of, of voting for another party would be uh, jeopardising actually uh, not just the SNP's position, but actually we'd be strengthening the unionist position and we need to ensure that that uh, isn't the case. But there'll be much chat uh, about that. There'll be you know, something we're thinking of, of course, as a, as a party to ensure that we get our message about SNP 1 and SNP 2 out there and get it out there quite forcefully as well. You've chosen to stand for selection for Glasgow Pollock. So what, what drew you to that area and what are the main issues you think the people in Glasgow Pollock are dealing with that you as an SNP MSP could address for them? Yeah, well I've been MSP for the last four years uh, across the city of Glasgow and a lot of work I've been working in uh, Pollock for the last four years uh, as well and got to know the community very well, the people very well and I'm very pleased to say the activists and the members of the SNP 
uh, very well as well. And I have my Glasgow boy born and bred. There's, there's nothing else to me in that, uh, you know, there's no other city that I have a connection with as I do with my home of Glasgow. Born, bred, raised, educated uh, in the city. And it's been an enormous pleasure in the last four years working across the city of Glasgow. But I have to say my heart lies with the communities of Pollock. And uh, the reason why I chose that was because I've never come across a community uh, that still actually represents, still has that actual feeling of community as much as Glasgow Pollock does. And I mean that uh, from Darnley, um, the south of the constituency, right the way through to Govan and, and Hillington and Penley and Arden, South Park, Darnley, all these areas have a real sense of community about them. Uh, but the second reason why I think why I wanted to stand at Glasgow Pollock is because it's an area of great need. Uh, I, whether you go to the Glasgow South West Food Bank, where we still have people you know, in this 21st century Scotland having to queue up for food, uh, they ran out of supplies a few weeks ago. Uh, the fact that we have food banks now running out of supplies shows that that's a community of need. Or, you know, when I've been to, for example, the uh, Carer Centre in Glasgow South West, just off Paisley Road West here in Glasgow, uh, in Glasgow Pollock, uh, you go there and you speak to the carers and they tell you, well, look, no, we didn't choose to be a carer. I didn't mm-hmm. choose to have an elderly parent that has dementia or a, a child with spina bifida or a spouse that had a brain injury and now I have to care for them. But I'm doing it, and now Glasgow City Council is trying to take away this carer centre from us. Or when you go down to Penny Community Centre, where they have Capability Scotland in there, and you speak to carers and members of the disabled community, and they tell you, well, we're getting austerity, it's taking away a £1,000 a year from our budget every year for the most vulnerable. When I get stories like that right across the constituency, it was clear to me, well, there's no other place that I want to represent that needs a real champion. And the current uh, Labour MSP there, uh, Joanne Lemoyne, you know, when I visit these groups, they tell me she's never been in, never spoken to them. Some of them have been around for, for 10 plus years and they've never had any contact from a local MSP, which I find a disgrace. And so I want to stand for that community. I want to sure that I represent them, that they have a voice uh, and somebody that fights their corner. You're one of our SMP MSPs that has a really good grasp of social media and uh-huh. you know how to use it well. How do you think social media is influencing politics in Scotland? You know, uh, social media just isn't influencing politics in Scotland. It's uh, changed the entire country. It's not just changed our country, it's changed the entire world. Uh, governments have been brought down because of social media. Remember the Arab Spring and Tahrir Square and all these things? This was done over social media, by and, by and large. Uh, you know, during the independence referendum, what a strong part social media played in changing opinion, shaping opinion, setting news agendas uh, constantly. Uh, so it's incredibly important. So, uh, as I said, there still is no substitute in terms of hard graft and going out there, but every single political campaign and political party has to have some social media strategy. And it's not about churning out pointless messages or regurgitating constant party lines. What it's about is engaging. You know, it would be the equivalent of these political parties that don't understand it uh, and just churn out message after message. So those are knocking at somebody's door and just shouting at them for the best part of five minutes without letting them engage in any conversation. What we're trying to do is engage over social media, you know, engage interest, seek where uh, seek solutions to problems that people might have uh, by, uh, by by reaching out to folk via social media. So you know, that's why you do it. And also, I, I suppose the other element for politicians specifically is that it gives you maybe a human side that other people mm-hmm. didn't really understand. I mean, who used to know that? Nicola Sturgeon would watch uh, The Voice or uh, <laughs> would be reading uh, this book or in, interested in Borgen or, you know, even getting a glimpse of her family, you know, the odd picture that maybe is put up with her mum and, uh, well, her mum is quite well known, uh, being the provost, of course, but uh, maybe other family members. And it brings just a, a softer human mm-hmm. side to politicians, which is important, uh, I think, for people to, to understand as well. So, you know, it's an important part of elections in the past. It will be an increasingly important part of elections and campaigns in the future as well. Along with the good that comes with social media, there's always the flip side and there's always <laughs> some bad. Mm-hmm. And you've developed a bit of a reputation for dealing with trolls mm. um, on Twitter in particular. Do you have a favourite example you can share with us? I think my favourite uh, example, yes, I've dealt with a number of trolls. And, and, and the one thing I would say uh, when it comes to the bad side of the internet and the bad side of social media it's important for us to realise that the voices of good always outweigh the voices of bad. For every Islamophobic or racist troll that I get, there's a thousand voices that will be saying the opposite uh, and be supporting. So I think it's important to put it in that context. In terms of dealing with a favourite troll, it would have to be the um, it would have to be when I dealt with David Coburn when he uh, 
uh, claim that uh, nowhere does it say that he's a European citizen on his British passport, of which I then took a picture of my uh, British passport, which says at the top, of course, European Union, and posted <laughs> it, and that went viral by uh, newspaper outlets and uh, got halfway across the world, in fact, and my cousin at, uh, who works for uh, Al Jazeera picked it up and uh, noticed it going around the Al Jazeera websites. And, so on and so forth. So I was quite proud of uh, quite proud of that moment. But there's many that I deal with, and I, I don't I don't report uh, you know I don't uh, uh, you know make public half of mm -hmm. what I get. I mean I report uh, many much of it to the, to the police, but also to Twitter. And they deal with it, and I'm getting better at dealing with it. Twitter police are very good at dealing with. It, I have to say they're dealing with a, with a number of cases uh, of uh, racist and Islamophobic abuse that I've suffered on social media. So they're doing a great job in that and investigating that. But I think it's important for us to show a united front against anybody who's homophobic, anybody who's uh, misogynist, anybody who's racist and anti-Semitic, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I've got every faith in the Scottish people and many others, of course, uh, that they're always the voices of good will always outweigh the voices of bad. Hamza, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us this morning and good luck in your selection. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Well, great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. You've been watching Broadcasting Scotland. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it. You can follow us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott to find out who we're going to be interviewing next and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye.